Our Europe Bureau Chief Jeff, Jeff Semple has a front row seat in Moscow. Jeff? Well, Donna, take a look at this impressive fireworks display lighting up the sky over Red Square and marking the end of Victory Day, a deafening display of patriotism and power. This is one of the final front lines against the so-called Islamic State here in Iraq, with ISIS positions just a couple of kilometers from here. And the battle for Hawija has just gotten underway. The Taliban allowed us to monitor one of their patrols here on the streets of Kabul as the extremist group tries to project a friendlier face to the outside world. At the same time, it's also seeking international recognition and desperately needed foreign aid. Well, we are witnessing a very tense, very improvised exercise in crowd control. As you can see, Austrian authorities are allowing thousands of refugees up these steps one at a time where they can board these trains bound for Munich. And here she comes. The 90-year-old can be forgiven for not walking the entire stretch. She's opted instead to go for a drive, as you can see, greeting thousands of royal watchers who have lined the street here for kilometers even at 90, keeping calm and carrying on. And if you walk the halls of the ICU, you can see up close the changing face of this pandemic. We were here in the first and second waves where you largely saw elderly patients sitting in these rooms. But these days, there are a lot more people who are younger. Global Nationals' Jeff Semple is also in London right now. He's standing near the intersection where the family was hit by that pickup truck. Jeff? Yeah, Donna, it has been an absolutely heart-wrenching day in this community. And take a look here as we're standing at the site where the family was killed. And this crowd has really been growing by the minute here tonight. At one point, people were lining both sides of this street. Some people climbing to lay flowers, others openly sobbing. Everyone here just trying to come to terms with the horror of what happened here on Sunday night. And a warning that some of the details in this report are difficult to hear. Kosar Mackey and her family were driving past this intersection at around 8.40 Sunday night. They stopped at the red light and waved at a group of pedestrians, a family of five wearing traditional Muslim dress, who were waiting to cross the street. My husband just rolled down his window and said salamu alaikum to him, and he said salamu alaikum, and he went. As soon as we turned the way, we got home. Minutes later, we heard the ambulances. Assalamu alaikum, the Arabic greeting means peace be upon you. It was likely the last words they spoke. Moments later, police say this pickup truck sped towards the family, jumped the curb, and plowed into them. Police say they were targeted because of their Islamic faith. It's scary because my husband and my children, we walk these, these, um, these uh, sidewalks, and, um, and we have other families, too, that walk these sidewalks, and it could have been us. That's what I keep thinking. It could have been us. Jen Karp arrived moments later to find bodies strewn dozens of meters down the street. None of them were moving except for the youngest, Fayez Afsal, just nine years old. He was found lying on the ground. It's crying, where's my family? I want my family, my leg hurts, my hand hurts. We told them that the, there was people helping his family and that you know we had, he had to go to the hospital and just I tell, told him to keep, keep his head down and we were trying to make sure he didn't see his family. It's terrible. The boy remains in hospital and is expected to survive. A family friend says he still doesn't know that his grandmother, his parents, and his 15-year-old sister are gone. It was a really tragic scene. Like, even the police officers were in tears. Friends say the family arrived from Pakistan about 14 years ago and were well known in the community. The couple, Salman and Madiha, both in their 40s, worked as a physiotherapist and an environmental engineer. Their daughter, 15-year-old Yumna, was a bright student at this high school where flags are flying at half-mast. Very shy and very loving and, you know, she was the kind who would look at you, smile and look away. You know, that, that's a beautiful smile. The community is devastated, horrified, but not all are surprised. Afraid for my life, for my daughter's life. What do you do? You go out and you know, you, you know, every truck I see, I look at it and I see a white guy and I'm, I, you know, I, they should open guns, man. Seriously, I need protection. We came here looking for peace. I see racism every day, every freaking day. 
Jeff, the police are saying little about the accused other than that he was motivated by hate. He faces four charges of first degree murder and one of attempted murder. What more do we know? Yeah, Donna, tonight many of the details around the suspect's life remain shrouded in mystery. I spoke to a number of his friends who live in this community who say they are in shock, but also in disbelief. They say they never had any inkling that their friend could allegedly be capable of carrying out such an atrocity. I would never have believed that he could have done something like this at all. Anyone else I would have believed could do this, but Nate not at all. Yeah, why do you say that? This is not his personality. Like, at all. Like, this is quite a shock. Armand Moradporian has known the suspect, Nathaniel Veltman, for several years and last saw him just three weeks ago. They work together in the shipping department at this egg farm in the nearby community of Strathroy. London police visited the plant Tuesday afternoon. Moradporian's family is from Iran and he was raised to be a Muslim, but says the suspect never appeared to take issue with that. Like, he never, ever thought twice about it. Like, me and him were great friends. He helped me out a lot when I was going through a lot of rough stuff. No one answered the door at his parents' home. Friends say he'd had a fight with his family and moved out a few years ago. His grandmother passed away on Friday. Morad Porian says the suspect had been arrested before for public intoxication, but otherwise was a devout Christian who mostly stayed out of trouble. He's a quiet, friendly, homeschooled Christian kid, literally. And that is now a question for police investigators to answer. How does a so-called quiet, friendly Christian kid become an alleged mass murderer? We have scoured his social media accounts online and turned up very little. The accounts didn't have much in the way of content at all. Police say he had no criminal record, no known ties to any hate group. And at this point, Donna, they believe he was working alone. Okay, Jeff Semple in London, Ontario, thanks. <laughs> Kabul is covered in black and white. Taliban flags, checkpoints and patrols, keeping a close eye on their newly conquered capital. So Gafar and his family have to hide. We're not showing his face because for five years he worked as a driver for the Canadian Armed Forces, fighting the same militants who now control his country. When the Taliban came last summer, we fled our home in Kandahar, he says. If they catch me, they will do bad things to me. They and seven other families are holed up in this secret safe house organized by Canadian veterans and funded through private donations. Food and medical supplies are brought in, so the families don't need to go out. But a few weeks ago, Gafar's 13-year-old son became restless. He snuck out for some ice cream and was stopped by the Taliban. The Taliban asked me where my family was. I lied and said they'd left the country, he says. They told me to get into their car. The Taliban drove him north to the front lines and put him to work in the kitchen. After 18 days of frantic searching, the family finally found him and negotiated his release. Fortunately, the Taliban didn't know Gafar had worked for the Canadians. It was the most painful 18 days, he says. I couldn't eat or sleep. I thank God my son is okay. Gafar is one of 2,000 Afghans and their families who supported Canada's military mission and who are now hiding in safe houses across Kabul. The former interpreters, drivers and cooks show us photos from their time with the Canadian forces. They've applied to move to Canada as refugees. Some have waited months for a response. <laughs> While others, like Gafar's family, have just been approved. His youngest is already eager to practice his English. Canada. Canada. <laughs> but even those with Canadian visas are stuck. With few flights leaving the country, a Canadian NGO, the Veterans Transition Network, has been slowly driving refugees out. A treacherous five-hour trek through the mountains, forced to anxiously cross more than a dozen Taliban checkpoints, which we're advised not to film. Before finally arriving at Pakistan's chaotic land border.
In two months, the Veterans Group has evacuated around 200 Canadian refugees this way. 2,000 more remain in Kabul, and time is running out. These families just received an email from the Canadian NGO that manages these safe houses, informing them that due to dwindling financial resources, on November 5th, some of these safe houses will have to close and some of these families will be forced out. It's going to be a big problem for us because uh, I have nothing to, to support my, myself. Mohammed Omar is a former Canadian Forces interpreter. For three months, he's hid in this safe house along with 50 other families. Last summer, Umar, his wife and four children left everything behind in Kandahar, told to travel to Kabul, where Canada planned to send a rescue flight before the Taliban took control. He says there's no going back. Right now, the situation in Kandahar is day by day getting worse and worse. Taliban visited each and every individual home. This Taliban police commander told Global News that Afghans who supported Canada's military have nothing to fear. People are just pretending they're afraid to convince other countries like Canada to accept them, he says. They are safe here. They should not be afraid. Reassuring words, but their actions speak loudest. <laughs> For four years, Darkhani worked security at the Canadian Forces base in Kandahar. Six months ago, her 23-year-old son was killed by a Taliban bomb attack. And just last week, another son was kidnapped and beaten until he gave them her phone number. She plays us their threatening messages, warning she can't hide. They will find her. The Taliban hates that I worked with the Canadians as a female police officer, she says. When the Taliban says they're peaceful and don't threaten anybody, they're lying. The opposite is true. The veterans groups say they've been told the Canadian government has no plans to fund the safe houses. And if nothing changes, some of those who helped to support Canada's military mission in this country will be left to fend for themselves on the streets of Taliban-controlled Afghanistan. Donna? All right, Jeff Semple in Kabul tonight. Thank you.